I'm Rob Tristensky. This is Symposium, where we bring people together to have conversations about the nature of liberalism and a free society. My guest today is Eric Smith, uh, Associate Professor of Rhetoric at York College of Pennsylvania and co-founder of the Journal of Free Black Thought. Thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me. Now, the name of that journal certainly catches attention. Why is it that there's the need for something called a Journal of Free Black Thought? Well, because there seems to be a tendency to think that Black people all think and act and um, live the same, right? Um, and that's not true of any group. You know, um, even the most homogenous group you can think of is made of individuals. Um, so we wanted to, you know, remind people of that or inform people of that who've never really thought about it. You know, um, intuitively, you know that, you know, uh, people are individuals, but um, when it comes to interacting with other people, thinking about people uh, politically and things like that, we tend to group people into categories. And um, we, the co-founders of Free Black Thought, think that's a bad idea. Um, at, the, uh, at the most detrimental to American society, it's illiberal to think that way. It goes against classical liberal values of individual freedom, um, um, freedom of expression, and things like that. Um, there are all kinds of um, black intellectuals. Let's just go with intellectuals. Um, you know, um, there are different uh, political affiliation. You know, there are black conservatives, black liberals, black libertarians, um, black socialists. Right? Um, these are all disparate. Uh, dispositions, and we want to showcase those dispositions. Um, the journal is one place where you can do that, but on the Free Black Thought website, there is a compendium, which is a list of uh, various Black intellectuals, Black artists, um, uh, Black um, podcast hosts, things like that, um, and it is organized by subject matter, so Afro-pessimism, is one thing um essentialism is another thing right um and so on and so on so ultimately with the journal and the website we're just trying to get the idea out there that black people are not a monolith yeah it reminds me of something that shelby Steele wrote years and years ago where he talked about how you know because he's was old he's one part of the generation that's old enough to remember life under segregation and he said that uh, uh, black people were collectivized, uh, whether they wanted to or not, <laughs> whether they wanted to be or not, under segregation, that you were always reminded that you were a member of this group. You had no choice to, but to be treated as a member of that group. And he said the irony is that after segregation was torn down, there were people who came back and said, no, we will. We still want to be a monolithic group. We still want to be treated as a group that all thinks and acts and, and believes the same. Yes, um, he had a term called integration shock, mm. right? um, which uh, basically denotes the tendency to, um, you know, step back when you do have freedom and the, um, the uh, liberty to be an individual, right? Um, it's scary being an individual. It's scary being out there, um, being responsible for oneself. It's more comforting to be a part of a community. So... You know, uh, people, uh, once they were given segregation or, or desegregation, rather, um, the integration part was difficult, right? Uh, Martin Luther King said that uh, desegregation is the letter of the law, but integration is the spirit of the law. Right. And, um, you know, uh, that that wasn't taken up by a lot of people, not everybody. So, you know, suddenly you find yourself... Uh, you know, with freedoms you didn't have, and you go into this world that you couldn't go into before, and they're not ready for you, and you're not ready for them, right? And, and that combination created what's still called integration shock. And some people, you know, they uh, they pushed through that. Other people, you know, went back and, you know, um, went back to their own, quote unquote. Well, and, and one of the things that I, I don't know if I read this on Free Black Thought or elsewhere, um, I, I think it's been mentioned there, is the class element of this, that oftentimes the people who sort of are celebrated in Hollywood and in, and in the in the highbrow magazines as representing the Black viewpoint 
and mm -hmm. speaking on behalf of oppressed black people are oftentimes very well educated, well off. You know, they grew up in safe suburbs and not, but you know, they're the ones who make the movies about life in the inner cities, but they themselves grew up in the safe suburbs. Right, right. Um, and you know, that is that level of arrogance is normalized these days. I'm going to speak for this entire group, you know, um, but the problem is people listen to them, you know, um, non-black people are like, okay, I'm going to listen to this guy and know everything about black people. This guy is going to accurately describe 50 million people, you know, to me, uh, 50 million individuals um, to me right now. And that's just normal. Now, if anybody else said something like that, you know, <laughs> you know, there, there would be a question or two <laughs> about this person's um, knowledge of so many different people. But for some reason, when, you know, one uh, African-American stands up and he has a platform, he says, this is what's going on with the black community. Uh, people listen, you know. Yeah, I, I think I think there's an integration shock for white people as well, in, in a sense that, you know, suddenly that we segregation has been knocked down. Racism has become a taboo. And so the question of, you know, if, if you have white people who have not actually spent a lot of time dealing with black people or dealing with, you know, having an understanding of, of all the different diversity of ideas, they're looking for a shortcut. They're looking right. for, I can pick up Robin D'Angelo or Ibram Kendi, and I can find out what I need to do to be on the right side on this issue. Yes. Um, I think uh, trying to find a shortcut to thinking is a, a tyrannical tendency we have, right? The tyranny of shortcuts is getting in the way of all kinds of things. Um, we tend to uh, step away from the very concept of nuance, right? Uh, you know, the, the fact that things are not, pardon the pun, black and white. You know, um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of intricacies going on with these individuals. And that's hard to take in, to conceptualize, to uh, keep organized in your head. So you're right. You know, it, it is a, listening to this one person, this one author or something like that, is a shortcut that can make us feel, you know, uh, a little more informed. And we are more informed. The thing is, we're not fully informed. Um, and we can't possibly be fully informed. The best we can do is treat uh, people as individuals, talk to them, figure out who they are, and act and react accordingly. You, know, you mentioned treating people as individuals, and you know you actually have a, a quote unquote anti-racist doctrine right now, which actually says individualism is part of racism, which has struck me as a very backward way of looking at things. Yes. Um, it is a very backward way of looking at things. Uh, this idea, what what is currently called hyper individualism, mm -hmm. the individualism, you know, just the idea that uh, you know the you, you are your own sovereign, right? Uh, you uh, enjoy individual liberty, uh, free expression. You are representing yourself and not a group of people, you know. Um, so. The issue with that and something that uh, contemporary anti-racist proponents, well, I'm anti-racist, you know, in a sense. So contemporary mm -hmm. critical social justice uh, right. uh, anti-racist will say, you may think you're an individual, but society is looking at you as a member of a group, right? Um, and that really bothers me because A, you're giving so much of your power away uh, to the specter of uh, white supremacy that's you know, uh, grouping you in as inferior and things like that. And it also, it, it, it robs the individual of agency. It doesn't matter what you think of me. I'm going to do what I want to do to reach my goals and, and um, you know, acquire life, liberty, and happiness, right? Which is the, you know, crux of the American creed. I'm going to do that regardless of what you think of me. Now, it does come, it, it is an issue if, the person who is assuming that I'm inherently inferior is my boss, right? Or is the chair of the tenure committee, you know, um, or the mayor, right? I mean, we, those those things are issues that need to be addressed. Um, or, you know, or the police chief. Right, <laughs> right. And, and, and those are issues that need to be addressed. I agree with that, obviously, uh, most sensible people. But most of the time, I don't really care what the person who 
um, yelled at me in traffic thinks of me. You know, um, I'm going to where I'm going. He's going to where he's going. And that's it. It has no bearing on my life or my life goals. Uh, so this is a long story short. Um, what's being called hyper individualism to me is healthy individualism. And we need to make that cool again. Yeah. So I, I, and I'm, I'm familiar that there's a long tradition of I don't want to call it black conservatism because I don't think it was that ideological, but a sort of. Uh, an old view of, of self-reliance as being the, you know, the key to making it, making it uh, forward in life. And it comes back from an era when the idea that you could rely, the, the, if there's one group that couldn't rely on government to come to their help, you know, it, w- it was black people because they, w- they were shut out in many places, especially in many of the places they lived, they were shut out from government. The idea that government was going to come in and help them basically was an idea before the 1960s that was not really that plausible. So how is it that, you know, because the whole idea of this highlighting this diversity of, of, of thought among, among Black intellectuals comes from the fact there's a perception that the political and economic and cultural left has sort of captured that demographic. So how is it that that happened? How is it that equation happened of if, you know, if you're a Black intellectual, you must be on the left? Um, well, I guess the left was in general more sympathetic to, uh, you know, the plight of the African-American, right? Um, Linda B. Johnson was a Democrat, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. You know, um, uh, various progressive mayors um, were Democrats. It seemed natural to align with the Democratic Party. Um, unfortunately, yeah, um, there are a lot of people, um, you know, who will call themselves liberals, who are actually doing more harm than good for the black community, because you know they they see them as victims that need to be uh, taken care of. Which, um, you know, I understand the sentiment. You know, it's a very noble sentiment, but it's also extremely infantilized, right? Um, uh, this idea that there's this group out there who always needs our help. Right, and, and they can't really stand up on their own. Um, and I, I mean, I'm somebody who um, prides myself on standing up on my own. Um, obviously, no man is an island. You know, we do need other people. But at the same time, if I want to do something, I'm going to figure out the schematics to do it. I'm going to figure out the best strategy to acquire it. And I don't need, you know, somebody else to say, okay, this is how we're going to do things. Or, uh, you know, uh, okay, I'll do this so that you can succeed, right? Um, this, this, this idea that every successful Black person is there because a white person let them, right? Uh, that idea is toxic. And there are people who come off as very, you know, proud to be Black who have that, who have that belief, that sentiment. And I'm noticing that. I'm trying to put a fix to it. The other thing I've noticed that about that and really struck me very strongly is the repetition of certain old racial stereotypes under the guise of anti-racism. So, for example, the National Museum of African American History put up this graphic about how white characteristics include like promptness and being on time and using hard work and using grammatical English and individualism and all these things, which are like a rep. You know, it, it struck me as you know, I, I've encountered a lot of these sort of alt-right people, the, the neo-racists of the, of, the, of the right online, and they say all the exact same things, but just from the other side. Uh, how is it that these, you know, these caricatures got embraced and, and, and pushed out there? Um, well, you do have the, um, you know, the racist contingent who does embrace this as proof of their superiority, right? There's that, but um, when Black people do it, I, I think it's a way to alleviate the pressure to uh, perform in a hegemonic and historically white context. Um, and I think it's wildly misguided, obviously, uh, especially when you look at uh, the list of white characteristics that the museum put up. Uh, that comes from uh, Judith Katz, who wrote a book, uh, I believe in 1979 or 1980, in which she lists all this. We now have Tima Oaken, who uh, has a similar list of things that are inherently white. And some of those things make sense, right? Uh, there's, there's a certain dialect of English that is considered mainstream, which is, you know, the, those conventions were created um, by 
you know, Anglo-centric uh, people. And since that's expected as the norm, one can see, okay, this is an issue that is, uh, that, um, is a detriment to Black people speaking African-American vernacular English. But most of that list is a problem. Delayed gratification is a problem. We, we, can't, we can't control our, our emotions and our desires. We, we're, we're, we're too infantile for that. Delayed gratification is only for white people. That is wildly insulting, right? And um, it, it, it still perplexes me that there are black people who would put that up and say, uh, these are white things. So we, you know, black people shouldn't be expected to, uh, to do this. Stop expecting black people to be on time, right? Stop expecting black people to uh, perform as well as white people in, you know, the sciences or something like that. Um, it's, it's, well, it's dumb, you know, quite simply. And I'm not sure how it gathered the steam it's gathered. Yeah, I think it also denies the actual experience and lives of a lot of, a lot of people who are the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I want to talk about is that you talk about this diversity of thought. And uh, I remember, you know, back in the day that you know, go back, cast back 30 years, if you looked at the quote unquote black conservatives or the people who were divergent uh, in their viewpoints on this, who were publicly known, it was actually a fairly small group of people, as I recall, at least the ones that you would know about. It was like Shelby, there was Shelby Steele and there was Thomas Sowell and maybe Walter Williams. And mm -hmm. you, know, you could tick off like half a dozen of them. And <clears throat> what strikes me is that with your uh, journal, you've got a much larger sort of group that you're pooling from. And I'm wondering if it's just simply that there are simply more black intellectuals now. There are more who are operating at universities and uh, who are teaching, who are writing, who are producing things. So you're going to get this greater diversity of, of thinking on the issue. Oh, definitely. I mean, there was a time when thinking black people was a monolith, was an understandable belief. Mm -hmm. you know? um, even if it was erroneous, it was understandable, right? Um, and, and you, you said it yourself, uh, you know, uh, 50s and, and, and 60, 60s and uh, previously, right? But it's 2021. You know, there are more uh, professional intellectuals. I mean, there are, you know, autodidactic intellectuals, uh, you know, throughout um, the African-American uh, history. But um, there are actually people who are getting paid to think who are Black, many more right now, many more black politicians, um, many more black business owners. And, you know, now it's time to notice the glaringly obvious fact that they're not all thinking the same. They're not all embracing the same goal. They don't all have the same education. They don't all have the same attitude toward education. Um, so we would do well, um, as Americans, not just black and white people, right? We would do well as Americans to realize that we are a country of individuals. You know, now you talk about there being a diversity of ideas. So, you know, I, I have all confessed that coming from the more libertarian end of things, I get excited, like, okay, you know, there's somebody who's going to speak up for libertarianism, but give me a sense of, uh, you know, so like somebody like a Thomas Sowell who talks about free market economics, I think, okay, that, you know, that, that draws my attention. But I, I also want to sort of get a sense for the whole breadth of different ideas and different perspectives that, that you're giving voice to at, at free uh, journal of feedback thought. Well, um, the idea is to give as many perspectives as possible, right? And this does not mean that we at Free Black Thought agree with all those perspectives. We think we owe it um, to Black individuals to you know, um, show people all the various ideologies uh, and ways of knowing uh, that one can find among Black people. I'm looking at the compendium right now and we have some essential readings um, regarding uh, activism, colonialism, uh, family and marriage, right? All the different attitudes within those categories. Um, humor, all right? Um, there is, a, you know, they, they say that the uh, most segregated space in America is the church. Um, it's also the comedy club. Yeah. It, it seems to be, right? But that's not actually the case. 
you know, there are various. And Angel Eduardo, um, Angel Eduardo, Eduardo, wow, it's early, um, wrote an article in Newsweek a couple of days ago about how, you know, um, he wasn't seen as authentically Black and Dominican when he was growing up. And one of the reasons why was his sense of humor. You know, um, he didn't, he laughed at things that um, the authentic Black Dominicans didn't laugh at and vice versa. And, you know, uh, that what one finds funny is a marker of group belonging as well as anything else. And um, I think that's a shame because uh, Angel Eduardo is very proud of his Black Dominican heritage. And it doesn't matter what jokes he laughs at. So even the category of humor is here to let people know, you know, that even that is a diversified concept. So we try to touch on everything we possibly can. Yeah. So, you know, the, it's interesting. The, the idea of Black thought being monolithic is part of a wider problem of all thought being monolithic. Um, uh, I know Lou Perez, who I've, I've interviewed here, uh, uh, talks about uh, how uh, he's writing a book called That Joke's Not Funny Anymore, about how uh, humor has become sort of like trapped as this tool of enforcing a certain political orthodoxy that you can't laugh, you, know, you can't laugh at this and you can't laugh at that. And it, it struck me, it reminded me of one of my favorite stories from a Soviet dissident, I think it was uh, Natan Sharansky, who talked about how when he was being interrogated, he was in, jailed by the Soviets and he's being interrogated. He would tell these jokes about, you know, the, the Soviet premiere and all these things. And he'd see his interrogators would want to laugh, but they couldn't let themselves do it. And he says, look, you know, I can, I can laugh when I find something funny and you can't. So tell me who's in prison and who's free. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, in that sense, for sure. That's very interesting. I like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Humor, humor is an issue. And there are a lot of people a lot of comedians, obviously, uh, coming out saying that this isn't fair. This is a, you know, this is stifling free speech, uh, things like that. Um, but the people who, you know, are saying you can't tell that joke anymore, right, um, have the, the best of intentions, right? Some jokes are inappropriate, you know, but uh, the thing is, the okay jokes are being lumped in with those inappropriate jokes. Um, and I can give a recent example. I believe Comedy Central uh, banned an episode of The Office uh, in which, uh, you know, there was a diversity training, you know, in, in Dunder Mifflin. And uh, Michael, being Michael, said a lot of inappropriate things in an attempt to be, uh, you know, uh, racially open-minded and, and, and things like that. The point of the episode is to point out the detriments of racial ignorance, how they come up and possible ways of dealing with them, you know? Um, and that was a very powerful episode and very funny. Um, but apparently that's off the table right now because, you know, uh, it's it, it, it on purpose and for a good reason um, has some incidents that are very racist. Right. Yeah, so the interesting thing about if there, a lot of these cases, there is a germ of truth. There's a, there's something that needs to be addressed, but oftentimes it, it then veers off into sort of, I would say more symbolic uh, action where it's like, okay, well, we've, we've canceled somebody on Twitter, but we haven't actually changed the law or we haven't actually changed how the world works. I mean, the George Floyd thing, I think is a great example of that, that you had this vast uh, no, you know, for coming from the more libertarian end of things, you know, the, I'm familiar with all sorts of ideas that people have had on policing reform over the years. And what strikes me is we had, you know, fast demonstrations, a huge amount of public attention, and hardly any of those policing reforms actually got made. Yeah. Um, there is a concept called prefigurative politics. Done right, what it means is you're performing the world you want to see, you know, um, Occupy Wall Street did this, right? They were performing uh, the world uh, they wanted to bring about. Um, but the point about prefigurative politics is that you also have to have a concrete strategy for bringing those things about. It's not enough just to uh, create a bubble where um, you know uh, that world, that viewpoint, that way of knowing is the primary, right? Um, we have too much prefigurative politics without the strategy. 
Um, Jonathan Smucker talks about this. Uh, Paul Reichstad uh, talks about this. The um, the empty prefigurative politics. It's all about the symbolism. And there are two people who are all about the symbolism. Um, the first are the virtue signalers, right? I'm going to say this so that you know that I'm on your side, right? Uh, but the second and probably the um, most depressing uh, group are the people doing the performing, right? Because so many times, and this goes back to individuality, uh, so many times people are looking for a safe space, right? A place where you know their anxiety is alleviated, they feel good, they feel comfortable, um, the world is the way they want it to be. And although it's a um, fabricated and contrived bubble, it feels good. So that's all they need. And all they need is that space. They don't actually need to take the steps to bring it about uh, societally, you know, that's, that's too much. All I needed was acceptance, you know? Mm -hmm. So these, uh, these political groups turn into fraternities basically. And it's all about the symbolism there. So, uh, yes, I'm glad you brought that up because it is an issue. And it also strikes me. And I, I, I say this cause I'm coming out of experiencing a lot of this on the right with the, the rise of Trump and the way he sort of took over the conservative movement that there's also, when you sort of look for safety in that safe bubble of being in your tribe and, you know, having, agreeing with everything else, you're also sacrificing a lot of your own thinking, your own individuality. You're suppressing that you are conforming in order to find the safety of the group. Yeah, um, I teach a course called American Philosophical Thought, and we're, uh, you know, we're talking about Ben Franklin and Thomas Paine right now. We'll do the Federalist Papers uh, next week. And an idea that keeps coming up is how much are you willing to give up, you know, um, to your government for safety? Mm -hmm. right? And uh, the classical liberal way of doing things is, you know, the government should be as uh, hand as, you know, um, hands off as possible and uh, it's all about self-dignity and individual freedom and things like that. Um, the idea uh, of tribalism apparently is in our DNA. You know, um, there's, there's nothing we can really do about that, but that doesn't mean we, you know, the, the tribes we pick are the tribes we have to pick, right? Um, there's another way of conceptualizing this tribe that makes the tribe larger and, and, and more inclusive. And, um, you know, uh, the, the point was that America was supposed to be a large, diverse tribe, right? That's not happening, obviously. Um, a large, diverse tribe that appreciates individuality and free speech and things like that. But even within that very large group, there are uh, people who feel more comfortable with this group or people who feel like they need to choose a group because they're, they're rudderless, they're floating out there by themselves. Nietzsche called, it, called people like that the homeless, right? Um, they don't really have a foundation, they don't really have a home, so they're floating around. I like that idea. Actually, my dissertation was about that, the benefits of being the homeless, right? right? Um, but most people, you know, have been, I guess, understandable sense of anxiety when it comes to something like that. Nietzsche was like, it's a good thing. You know, if you are homeless, if you have no group, then you have every group. If you have no ideology, you have every ideology open to you. You know, you're, you're, um, you're more adaptable. You, you have to become more adaptable. And adaptability is a key aspect of emotional intelligence, of um, workplace leadership, right? And in my opinion, of having fulfilled, a fulfilled life, right? Um, the adaptable person isn't as in need of a group or a tribe as the people I was talking about earlier regarding prefigurative politics. So that's my long-winded answer to what you just said. You know, I, I think what you said about how America was supposed to be this larger, more diverse tribe where we'd have, you know, the uh, we'd find unity, but also with within with lots of freedom. I think that actually is largely the case. And as, as often the, the happens that you have a disjoint between how people are actually living their lives and how the people who talk about our lives talk about it, right? So you know, there's an intellectual class that has its own sort of obsessions that it often sort of imposes on, on the real lives that people are living. Yes, I believe um, Heterodox Academy 
came out with a study called Hidden Tribes. And, you know, the the percentage of people on the extremes are relatively small. The yeah, was- middle, including what they call it, the exhausted middle, right, <laughs> consists of people who um, don't feel so extreme about this. People who do understand the benefits of classical liberal values, right? People who do understand the benefits of individuality. Um, but those aren't the people with microphones. Those aren't the people with platforms. Right. I, I, if, if this is the same study I'm thinking of, they, they found like 8%, the sort of woke left is about 8% of the population, yeah. but they're like vastly overrepresented on places like Twitter. And because Twitter has this weird influence, because you know, everybody in the media is on Twitter, that has this influence on the people in the media. So you get this sort of amplification of this very small uh, group of people. It, it, it reminds me, of, like, for example, the, I think the emblematic example of this is the word Latinx, right? Yeah. Which is supposed to be the, the politically correct way to refer to uh, people of Hispanic origin. And if you poll actual Hispanic people, like 4% of them actually accept that as a label. It doesn't make any sense to the 90, other 96% of them. Right. Um, and a lot of that 96% haven't even heard of the word, right? But yeah, if you listen to uh, academia, you think it's a normalized term. And if you don't do it, there's something wrong with you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. So, so talking about the state of the world being better than you know what the intellectuals and the, the loudest voices often want us to think, this is something I've been fascinated about with, um, and I'm, I'm doing some more stuff on this with Symposium, which is the question of progress. Because there's, you know, we have undoubtedly made progress in the last, you know, 200 years, especially on on multiple fronts. Uh, not just you know uh, on on, econo- on the economic well being on the amount of freedom people have, uh, you know representative government went from, went from a new and untried idea to sort of a, a global norm, and we've certainly made progress on the issue of race, but you will get yelled at if you dare to assert that progress has you know there's this uh, again one of this loud sort of minority that will yell at you if you dare to assert that such a thing of progress has actually happened. And I guess my question that I want to explore is how different would our discussions look? How, how would we approach things differently if we started by recognizing the existence of progress? I, I, I will say this. Um, what some people call progress, other people call regression. Like, um, you know, ethnomathematics, you know, changing math instruction so that the, you know, the Black kids can pass the test. People think that's a good thing. You know, it, it very much is not, right? And, but that's out there. It's just lowering expectations uh, for minority students. I don't think we should get rid of tests. I think we should pass them. Well, the concept of progress weakens the victim narrative. And the victim narrative is the primary tool of critical social justice oriented uh, anti-racist, right? Um, so if you acknowledge that things have gotten better, you're, you're, you're weakening that because the victim narrative is about, you know, we are downtrodden and we need immediate, um, you, know, uh, you know, policies or, or things like that to get us uh, uh, up to a par with uh, the rest of America. Um, and I mean, it's, I, I, I'm a big fan of the, hey, we've come a long way, we can keep going. You know, um, you know, there's no need to stop or slow down. You know, in fact, we should be picking up steam. Uh, I'm, I'm that guy. I, I'm, I'm, uh, Mr. We're just, uh, we're rising. We're socially mobile. You know, if, if we're great now, imagine us in 20 years. That's, that's my attitude. Um, but that is not conducive to the narrative. The narrative has to be, oh my God, what was us? You know, um, we, we, we need to deal with this. We need to destroy the specter of white supremacy because that's what's keeping us down um, when that's not really the case. Yeah, and I think there's a counterpart to that on the right, which is sort of the, the Trumpian tear it all down narrative, that everything's horribly mm-hmm. corrupt. And so there's no reason not to just go around breaking things and, and uh, uh, you know, destroying the institutions, attack, attacking the existing order. And that, so they're both the right and the left have sort of gravitated towards that because, you know, if you accept progress, you're pushed towards more of an incrementalist uh, uh, 
approach to reform. It's like, well, we've we've come a long way, so let's keep you know making new incremental improvements to what we've already been doing. Whereas it, if you have if you deny progress, it pushes you towards a revolutionary model. Everything is terrible, and the whole, everything has to be uprooted and destroyed and totally replaced. And I think there's like a faction on each side that that wants to do that in different ways and for different reasons, but they have that attitude of, we want to totally change and and, and re, rework everything. And therefore we can't acknowledge that anything has been going, has been going right up to now. For sure, um, well, there is a tendency or a desire to tear things down and um, rebuild them in a different way. Um, the issue is, though, um, many people who, you know, express that sentiment, I want to tear it down, they don't have an answer for what they want to build back up. Not really. You know, there, there's, there's, there's no strategy beyond tear it down. And I mean, I, to an extent, I get that. I mean, the, the point is to get things out of the way and then maybe collaborate toward, uh, you know, fixing things. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but I understand, I guess, the... Um, the attitude uh, that creates that sentiment. And that goes to a, a question that's often been asked about the sort of new anti-racist doctrines, which is what's the end point? You know, that it's described as being a religion without salvation, right? So it's, it's a religion that has guilt and uh, um, uh, atonement, but there's no such thing as salvation. There's not a vision for the end point we're going to arrive at that will be after a period that will be the end of the period of, of, of racial conflict or that will be a period of racial harmony. So I guess the question I would have is, you know, what is the end point that you're looking for? Well, um, I will start answering that question with another question, right? Um, will, okay, so this idea that there's no redemption, right? That um, racism is forever. Uh, Derek Bell's idea of racial real, realism. We can't, we can't get rid of it. We can only fight it, right? Um, if we tear things down, is that still true? You know, um, or if we tear things down, then that system's gone. So now we can get rid of racism. Um, that, um, that's what I'm wondering, and that's what people don't seem to want to answer. And um, I, I, I really need that answer, you know, um, before I can uh, move on and start trying to um, understand um, where they're coming from, where critical social justice activists are coming from. Um, the world I want to see, well, I understand the uh, aversion to incrementalism, right? Um, when, how many people uh, said, well, it's not time yet, you know, for, you know, that's that's infuriating, you know? It's not time for you to uh, have the privileges and the opportunities that we have, you know? Um, that's also infantilizing. So I get that. I think we need to figure out a way to have the shortest um, amount of time for incrementalism uh, without taking away, you know, uh, classical liberal values like free speech, individualism, and, and, and things like that. Um, how can we speed things up? And I think there's a way to discuss how to speed things up uh, without tearing everything down. That, that strikes me as a great place to end well, thanks so much for sharing this perspective. I, I found the Journal of, of, of Free Black Thought very interesting, and I'm following it. It's, uh, it's what is it? What's the web address people should go to? Uh, freeblackthought.com. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, you are very welcome. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to express these ideas. I like to do that. I'm Rob Trusinski with Symposium Magazine. My guest today has been Eric Smith of the Journal of Free Black Thought. You can subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast. And above all, you can read more at symposium.substack.com. Thank you for joining the conversation.